Hey, everybody, and welcome to today's live. I'm Chef AJ, and today I'm going to be talking all the way from Maui, Sarah Taylor. She's authored several books, and I'm going to introduce her to you right now. Welcome, Sarah. Hey, thank you. It's great to be here. Absolutely. I can see how beautiful it is behind you. Yeah, it is. And as you know, we uh, we don't live here full time or we're in the Seattle area part time. And, and, you know, I've known you for what, like 17, 18 years. So it's really nice to be here during this specific time of year with everything that's going on, you know, uh, being stuck at home most of the time. So we feel really lucky. I can't imagine any place more beautiful to be at any time than Hawaii. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that is absolutely amazing. Is it different there? I mean, it is part of the United States. It's not. It's not connected. But is is does it feel? I mean, does it feel different there than it does here with the sheltering in place? They've been really strict here in Maui with the coronavirus, uh, you know, issues going on. So we've. I think we've got the least, even you know, per numbers. Hi, puppy. Um, <laughs> I think we've got the least even per like 100,000 people. So we're doing really well, but they've been really strict about it. And they just decided we can't go walking on the beach. So there have been like letters to to the governor going out about that now. <laughs> oh, no. Well, at least you have a very, very beautiful view. Yeah. I would live in Hawaii except for that darn quarantine period. Yeah, but you know, you're gonna be stuck somewhere. That's right. That. That's my favorite place on earth. So I know you only have one copy of one book with you, but talk about your books that you've written. Oh, thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, so I've written a couple of vegan books. One of them is called Vegan in 30 Days. It was done years and years ago. Um, just really helping people do simple things that can be hard, like learning where to eat and what to buy and how to have Thanksgiving at your house, all kinds of things, you know, and, and what you can and can't eat. And then the second book, um, after I gave a lot of lectures of that book, I had these people in the audience often asking the same question. And the question was, well, I've been vegetarian for, you know, so many years and I can't go vegan. And so I wrote Vegetarian to Vegan, uh, all the reasons why vegetarians might want to consider going vegan. So that's where that comes from. I think that's so important because when I meet people that are vegetarian, assuming they're doing it for ethical reasons, a lot of them don't really understand that the most ethical thing you could do is to give up dairy and eggs. Yeah, I think ethically it definitely is, but healthfully too. I remember um, I used to work with Joel Furman and I'm pretty sure it was Joel who said one time, you know, if somebody was going to give up one thing for their health, I would have them give up dairy. Absolutely. And yet that is the thing that seems to be the hardest for so many people. And seems to be healthier. Like they think that's healthier than steak or chicken and things like that. And in most cases, some, some it might be, but in most cases it's not. So that's yeah. Not at all. So I always look forward to you, you write a letter every year at Christmas. Like I, I wish I always think about doing that and then I forget it right away, but I get that letter from you every year telling me like everything that's been going on. Ah, thanks. Yeah. It's been a big year. <laughs> yeah, like that, that's why we're here. So we don't mean to drop a bombshell on you, but I think your story and, and your attitude towards what's happened is going to inspire people. So tell us about your year because this is a different year for you. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about it because this is really, um, I mean, not only have I had a lot of people asking me to come on podcasts and things, but now I've heard that there is going to be a documentary and some things like that. So I think the story, I, I wouldn't think it was that that big of a deal, but apparently it is for a lot of people. So I'm really glad we're talking about it today. Um, so I'll start by saying what's happened. And what has happened is, you know, like I said, we've been vegan. Well, you've been vegan longer than I have a lot longer, but I've been vegan 17 or well, 18 or 19 years now, 18 years, something. And, um, you know, I've been healthy. I've been, you know, my brain works, I've done well. And, and then uh, I switched out of medical uh, research. And by the way, I am going to tell everybody before I get too started that sometimes I do miss words and sometimes I do forget what I was talking about. So if that happens, don't be surprised. Um, but, um, and what were we just talking about? <laughs> yeah. What, what, what you, the, the year, the profound year you've had, because we're going to drop a bombshell on it. Um, oh yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, I had been working in medical research for 20 years and, um, well, I'd worked with Joel Furman for a while too, but I mostly worked in ophthalmology research for the eyes. And then I, um, decided that I was going to switch and get another master's degree and go into counseling. 
And I really loved it. And I ended up, you know, in all of my research, doing uh, some research on a type of um, a type of counseling called existential counseling. And it's often on topics, things like, you know, death and, um, you know, people who are going through midlife crises, things like that, you know, what's going on. And so interestingly, I ended up doing that. And uh, um, sorry, I'm, I'm stuck with where I was again. Um, yeah, um, you, you were doing the counseling and- Yes. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> so yeah, I was doing the counseling and um, in that counseling, I just thought, wow, um, I, I really, really want to do this type of existential counseling. And interestingly, I met a woman at the hospital who was teaching the vegan diet and she was a medical doctor and she was like, oh, most of the doctors are just, you know, wanting me out of here. You know, the way I'm talking about the vegan diet, but she was a cancer doctor. And so we, we decided we were going to do cancer stuff together. We were even thinking about writing a book together on the cancer, um, you know, the vegan diet for cancer patients. And then I said to her, you know, I'm also just graduating with my master's degree uh, for um, counseling. And she said, oh, my God, if that's true, uh, I really, really would love to have you at my office. I give you a free room and everything because I, I have all these patients that have cancer that are really upset. And you can imagine that. And I said, yeah. So I went in to see these patients. And for a year, I was dealing with cancer patients. It was really interesting. So here's where my story comes in is one day I had this patient and she was leaving. I gave her a hug goodbye. She's walking down the hall. And next thing you know, long story short, I won't get into all the details, but I immediately start having a seizure and end up across the, uh, across the street at the emergency room. And I was having um, a seizure that they didn't know. At first they thought I had something else, but after two weeks, they ended up doing brain surgery, cutting into my brain and saying she's got brain cancer. And at the time they thought it was, um, even though they only officially called it a phase two, cause you can't really go digging to the back of the brain without causing problems. They just took a little sample from the front and the back you could see with the x-ray uh, or whatever it was, MRI, that there was a, a like a pea sized piece that was really bright white. And they said, that's almost, almost a hundred percent of phase three, Sarah. And I said, okay. And so uh, three and a half weeks later, I did another MRI and that was four times bigger than it was. And the doctor just said, Sarah, you know, I've been doing this for 35 years and it's rare that I see it go this fast. I really think you have stage four. This is a glioblastoma. And I said, okay, okay. And everybody would say, you know, is it okay? Are you okay? <laughs> I'm like, it's okay. And they say, how can this be okay? You know, whether I was talking to the doctor, or I was talking to friends or family, as I told them this information, they'd say, how can this be okay? And I said, I have had an amazing life. You know, I've been so blessed to be brought up by parents who were loving and kind. You know, they, we weren't rich or anything, but we were in a, in a, a neighborhood that was it was fine. You know, like we didn't have to worry about losing our lives or anything like that. And neighbor, we stayed out late at night playing with our friends and went to college and, and all that stuff. And that's what really, um, you know, got me going. I had a brain that worked well. I was able to go to college and that changed the world for me. And I think, wow, you know, so many people my age are sitting in front of the TV every day they are, um, you know, really weighing a lot, uh, you know, maybe hundreds of pounds over what they should be. And they don't want to be that way. It's not like they're not thinking about it or anything else, but they're having a, a tough life. And when I think about my life, I think, wow, you know, I've written books and I've started a new career and I liked my old career. And, you know, I've, I've gone skiing and I've traveled and done a lot of great things. So I've decided that this diagnosis is not something that I'm going to be upset about. I'm going to be really, really grateful really grateful. I, I, I mean, I'm upset about it. I mean, I, I, I just, I don't know how you, I, I just think it's remarkable and extraordinary. And, and I never know what to say when somebody tells me they have, can like when you told me we were, I mean, I mean, like I felt like, God, I, I shouldn't have even bothered her. With, I mean, I send you an email about something so insignificant and then you, you know, you write back and it's like, I, I never know what to say. Like, what do you say to somebody that tells you, I mean, they, they, it just, it's, it, people think of cancer as the worst thing that can happen to them. I think a lot of people think that. Yeah. I think that's a great idea to ask why. 
uh, for yourself, if that's something for you, because, and by the way, I have these little videos, I'll just say as a side that I've got on YouTube now, but if you want to friend me on Facebook, um, my Facebook name is Sarah Kenefick Taylor, K-E-N-E-F-I-C-K, because that's the only way people would find me separately from all the millions of Sarah Taylors. But I have videos that the very first one started the day after Thanksgiving, where I talked about what's going on. And what I say is, you know, two things. I mean, one is really living a life where you can look back at it and say, wow, you know what? I've, I've traveled the world. I've been on safari or whatever it is you like to do. You know, um, I've had, I've had uh, careers I've enjoyed, not just careers that, okay, well, I got some money coming, but now I got to go back on Monday. You know, stop, stop doing that. Find out what you're going to like and then what you're going to really enjoy getting up for most days. Maybe not every day, but most days. Um, you know, that's a really big part, but another big part too, and this is what's really, um, affected me in such a big way is I had this life where, you know, when I was younger, I'm going to say up to about early thirties, I was so, <laughs> I didn't think I was at all. I thought, oh, I'm smart and you know, everything else. I was really, um, what's what I'm looking for when someone just doesn't have uh, a strong, you know, you know what I'm trying to say. Just, just not a lot going on for me. I was, I was worried most about my appearance, my hairdo. If I gained three pounds, oh my God, three pounds, you know, I didn't want to be more than 138. You know, it was just kind of crazy. Um, and when I went to, um, well, I think it's about the time I met you. So that was when I met John Robbins and I had read his book and that was what turned me vegan. And John Robbins said, you know, <clears throat> it was not that he said anything. It's just that in his book, I really started to put the animals before my weight. And I picked his book up because I was in a huge hurry to lose some weight. <laughs> and when I lost his weight or when I, when I lost weight because of his diet, it didn't matter anymore because I wasn't really there just to lose weight. I was there, um, because what he had said got me understanding how bad things are for the animals. And that really, really changed me. And I just thought, wow, I can't, I can't eat that non-vegan stuff ever again. And I went vegan overnight. And so that really changed me. And for 10 years, you know, I've always been really left brain, <laughs> which is the side of my, um, that's the side of my head that's, you know, having a problem is the left brain. Um, but left brain really, you know, you, you get your details down and you start doing things. And, you know, it's very, um, like scientists tend to be very left brained, whereas people in theater, or people in music, they tend to be very right brain. And um, anyway, as I did that, um, I'm trying to think where I was in my story. So I was, I had read John Robbins information, which had a lot of left brain information in it, but it also got you thinking about why am I eating this when it's causing so much harm to animals? And I've always loved animals, always loved animals, you know, cats, dogs, whatever. And I just never really thought about it much. Um, so anyway, I, for like 10 years, I was, I was reading books and learning more about it and really trying very, very hard to, um, just get a little bit more knowledgeable and learn more about spirituality and things like that. And then we bought this house in Maui. And when we bought the house in Maui, that was about 10 or 10 years ago or so. That's when things really got different for me because out here in Maui, um, there's a huge vegan group out here and many, many people in the vegan group are part of a spiritual group as well. So you don't have to be, you know, you could be whatever you want. And when I say spiritual, it's very vague. So you could be Christian, Jewish, whatever you want. You could be, yeah, all of them above or, you know, it doesn't really matter. But I love that. And I, it really had got me starting to be more careful with my reading. Like I used to just read and shut the book and read the next book, shut the book. But now I was actually practicing for the first time, you know, getting into meditation, asking people who really were way ahead of me in their practice and things like that. And that's when life really started to change. I mean, boy, AJ, I'll tell you, it was like, I really started changing who I was as a person. And I'll say the biggest point that came out of this that I'm really trying to tell everybody and people are really kind of grabbing onto is that over those years, what I learned is to really be present with what I am doing and where I am. And so it, it's nothing that happened overnight. It's like I read a book and it was fixed or anything like that. 
But over time, I started doing things just like making my life a little quieter, stop watching the TV so much. I quit watching the news years and years before, which is super helpful, really helpful. Um, but I just uh, started spending a lot of quiet time. So if I was at the airport, you know, which I did every week for work, I didn't sit there on my phone the whole time as I'm getting on the plane. Hey, okay, so I need to talk to you and get on the plane. I got two minutes. Blah, 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 blah. It wasn't like that. I just said, nope. I will call them when I'm in the car, when I land. And I would just sit there in quietness and I would look around and I'd say, oh, look at that little lady's um, grandchild or, oh, look at that guy's book he's reading. He's loving it, you know? And I would just notice these things and be present. And when we're present, this is when life starts changing. You know, this is when life really starts changing. Has anybody given you any opinion on what could have caused this in somebody so young and healthy? That's a great question. Um, no, there's very only two or three people out of like a hundred thousand or something get this. It's really rare, and the things they don't know what's really causing it in most people because there's so few of us that have it. Um, there is one interesting thing that I heard about diet is that not that diet causes it, but that if you get it, you can go on a keto diet because the keto diet, the only thing it's known to help, I think. I mean, in the short term, if people lose weight, they'll have better diabetes and things like that. But long term, the one thing it's been shown to work out on is the brain. And um, so this was a really interesting conversation because Joel Furman said to me, you know, Sarah, the only thing that we know can increase your life a bit. And there's very few studies already. So we don't have a lot of information. So right now it's not a long time, but it might be if you do well. But if you go on a really severe keto diet, like 85% fat, we can at least get you probably an extra four months. <laughs> and by the way, the, the, the months you get are very, very low. I'm, I'm for my genetics and everything. It's under, under a year already is what they're guessing seven and a half months. So uh, we'll see what happens. But um, uh, where was I going with that? What about fasting? I mean, is it, cause if you fast um, your ketosis, would that help? Yeah. So if you're, if you're, Brain has any kind of sugar in it, which either comes from sugar or from carbohydrates because they turn to sugar, that can cause a problem. So yeah, if you fast, but you can't fast your whole life. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I, I did fast quite a bit uh, when I was getting my chemo and radiation the first time and um, it was not comfortable, but yeah, I did feel better, so. People are saying you're inspiring and they love your attitude. You're so sweet. And thank you, man. I, you just, I, 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 got, I just, if I would, I, I can't, you know, nobody can really imagine what they do until it happens, but I think I would just be so angry. Yeah. I, you know, I think a lot of people are, and this is where I go back again to like, you know, I, I dealt as a therapist with cancer patients. And so I saw them so sad and so unhappy and when I started working with them, often it would only take two or three months of working together where things would completely change. And it was just asking different questions. And, you know, when you have questions like, you know, how could this be happening to me? Why when I'm so young, um, you know, who screwed me over kind of thing? All of that doesn't matter, you know, it's happening. And something like brain cancer is very, very unlikely to keep you alive after a year or two. It's, I mean, it can happen for a very small number of people. I hope I'll be one of them, but you know, statistically it's extremely low. And I think, you know, we, we are all gonna die. And so this is where I think I've kind of become kind of popular with podcasts and things lately is that people start saying, well, how, how are you okay? And I say, well, I've thought about this because all these years, you know, since I got to Maui and got involved with the spiritual group, I've been reading books and asking questions and wondering, like, what do I really believe about religion or spirituality? Because, you know, I was English, you know, my mom's English and I was brought up in a Christian household. And so I was told, hey, you know, this is Christianity and you're going to go to heaven. And so I just believed it for many, many, many years. And I'm not saying any, anybody shouldn't believe it. But what I am saying is that you need to learn to believe something that important on your own brain, not because someone told you to believe it. And so that was the big thing for me was that I was just sitting there, um, you know, watching <clears throat> 
people talk to me and how upset they were at the whole idea of, of, um, sorry, I forgot what I was talking about again. <laughs> That's okay. You know, it's funny. I, I am, I'm recovering from a concussion and, and this happens to me all the time. Right. I walk in to the pantry to get, get cinnamon and I'm standing there and I don't remember <laughs> why I'm in the pantry. So yeah. don't worry about it. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, I can't remember what um, it was. In, in touch with the spiritual community, in some ways you've prepared for this because you were questioning what your spiritual beliefs are. Yes. And oh, thank you. I'm so glad <laughs> your brain's doing that well. well right no, but I, I'm a good, I'm a good listener. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you said it was, um, say, say the word again. Um, the, 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 how that you, in some ways you prepared for this without knowing it, like yeah. just by being in the spiritual community, being a counselor of people that had cancer. Yeah. And being prepared for it. So, you know, that was just a really big deal, I think, because one of the things I've learned is that as I've gotten older, I've just realized like, Hey, I've, I've asked myself, what do I believe? Like, Sarah, what do you believe? And as, as I read all these different spiritual groups, you know, everything from Christianity to Judaism to Buddhism, I mean, all over the world, I read these things and I went and talked to people and listened to lectures and all kinds of things. And then I found out what I really do believe. And I don't even need to tell anybody because what I believe isn't important to what anybody else believes. They need to figure out for themselves. But um, I will say, here's one thing I will say is that because I was a medical researcher, you know, I can be pretty like hard to convince sometimes. And, uh, you know, so if someone says, oh, yes, we had eight angels running around our house yesterday, I'd be like, oh, really? Are you sure? You know, just because that's my, that's how I think about things. But what I found was that um, there were a couple of books that I read that really, really is a therapist, is a therapist and as a researcher made me go, whoa. One of the, and they sound like they're written by the same person and they're not, they're not even related, but one's called Life After Life and one's called Life Before Life. And Life Before Life talks about people who say, oh, I used to be so-and-so in my last life. And what you'll find is when you look at the research by that, which by the way, University of Virginia has been doing research for 30 or 40 years on that now. And they found that it's almost always children, like maybe up to five to seven years old that are talking about um, how, how much they can live. Uh, I mean, sorry, how, how old they, or how, who they were in their last life. And so what happens is that when, when that happens, and this is all over the world, they don't just take American kids, but they take them all over the world. And when a kid says, oh, I used to be so-and-so, you know, oh, I used to be Chef AJ. Oh, really? Tell us about that. So they don't say, oh, you mean Chef AJ down in California, blah, blah, blah. They don't do any of that. They just say, oh, tell us about Chef AJ. And if the kid goes, well, I was Chef AJ and I cooked because I was a chef. And that's all they could say. They'd take the kid out of the, out of the research and say, yeah, it didn't have enough information. But there were stories in there that were unbelievable about how much information these kids would have. And um, someone that I know who I met in, in research, who was very, I mean, she was a doctor and she was extremely researching and very close to other ideas that could happen. Um, her daughter came to her at one and a half years old and I'm not going to give her name or anything, but when her daughter was very young, she um, she was holding her daughter and her daughter just gave a couple words here and there like mama doggy or that kind of thing. She didn't really have, have long words. Anyway, her mother um, had been dead for five or six years. And by the way, when someone, well, maybe she's dead seven years or something, but by the way, they say that the average is she can change, but the average change in um, if somebody dies and is reincarnated, they usually come within five, seven years. <laughs> so this is interesting. Her mom died, who is a psychiatrist. And then uh, somebody came in as her daughter and her daughter was one and a half years old in her arm as she's getting ready for um, you know, her, her daughter's uh, crib. And her daughter says, hey mom, and grabs her cheeks and turns her and looks at her and she starts going over uh, I can't remember the guy's name I, I, anybody else would but it's a famous poet who does poetry for adults it's not children poetry at all and it was one of these long long poems and this kid uh, announced the poem from beginning to end without any problems at all 
I mean, this kid couldn't even speak like that yet. It was only one and a half years old. And uh, that was a poem that her mother used to do every week. Even when she'd moved out, even when she was married, you know, her mom would call her and do that poem. So it seemed to her, even as someone who's totally against anything that's not well researched, she was, she was so emotional about it. And she said, I don't even like to talk about this because people would think I'm crazy, but this is what my daughter did. And there are a lot of stories like that. So when you start reading about them to me, and this might, be not, not, might, might not be true to other people listening, um, but to me, when I hear stories like that, I go, wow, you know, when it's that many thousands of people with stories like that, I think that's really interesting. <laughs> is there reincarnation? And then you get to decide for yourself if you believe it or not. And that's when things get really, really interesting. What book, what book can we find this story in? So that book was Life Before Life. There was a similar book called Life After Life. And so that was people who die for a short time, you know, like a minute or two in the hospital, and then they come back to life. And um, there's actually a really big research study that just got done that was done in um, cardiovascular patients recently. They did over 2,000 patients. And they, when they were, um, you know, having a heart attack, and then they actually died, but were brought back to life. They asked them, uh, anything happened? And about 90% said, I don't remember anything, you know, but 10% all kind of had the same story with generally a lot of the same details. And it was like, oh my gosh, you have no idea. It was amazing. It was so white. It was totally bright and white. And, you know, I could see people that were dead in my family or, you know, they all had details and many of the details were very much the same between different people. Um, but I thought that was really interesting because when you're looking at over 2000 people, you now have over 200 people who are telling very, very similar stories and they're very um, happy stories. And that I think was great, you know. You didn't even for a moment, I mean, what was it like when you first got the diagnosis? Do you remember, were you shocked? Were you sad? Were you, I mean, I, I, I just, I, I have so much empathy because I cannot imagine what you had gone through. Yeah, none of that. And I, the reason I say none of that is not because I was diagnosed and then I went into all of this um, reading and, and research. I'd done that years, for the past 10 years, like I said, I've been reading and researching and going to lectures and things like that, meditating. And so when the doctor looked at me and the doctor came in and his face was just down and he said, Sarah, I'm so sorry. You know, I'm really, really sorry. And I, I couldn't be more upset about your genetics. And, you know, cause when you look at all the details, I mean, everybody does pretty poorly, but with my genetics, it's the worst. Um, and, you know, when he said all that, I was like, it's okay, you know, it's fine. And, you know, at first, the first month, I think maybe two months, I have people in my life saying, oh, you're going to come at it. You know, you're just, you're just, you know, that's what I'm looking for. Like not worrying about it right now. You're, you're pretending like it's not a problem right now, but it'll get you. Don't worry. You know, it's never gotten me. I'm not afraid to die. Totally not afraid to die. And I'm more than anything. I'm just for the past many years, I've been so grateful at everything that's been going on. And it's not like some bad things haven't happened, but in general, I've had a really good life. And I'm just sitting here just so grateful all the time that it's hard. You know, if a doctor says, hey, you're gonna die. For me, I think, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I had this life. You know, like I, I would so much rather have this 48 year life that I've had than many, many people's 80 year lives that I've seen going on. Wow. But before this, you, you had pretty good health in all areas, correct? Yeah. Yeah. It kind of came out of nowhere. How did your friends and family respond? They have had a hard time, but not more than the average family would. Um, but yeah, in general, I think that's difficult. Uh, you know, to ha I think for me, and I told my husband this, I said, I think I would have a much harder time if you had this diagnosis than me, because I would hate to be left without you. Uh, for a while, even though my belief so that we'd probably find each other sometime in the future. I don't know. Um, but it would be hard, you know, to finish my life without him. I'd be sad about that, but you never know, you know, like maybe, maybe you're sad for six months or 12 months. And then you meet this amazing person who reminds you of your husband and, you know, you have a great time with that person. And I don't know, we, we just don't know. 
And I think that's what we humans tend to do is we tend to think we know what's going to happen and we tend to assume it's going to be bad and negative. And so I, often we have to be. Monica says, is Sarah 48? Yes. Wow. Yeah. You know, I hope you're writing a book right now because I think you could help so many people just with your attitude because it's not one that I've seen before. Oh, thank you. I don't know if I can write a book. I've written three in the past and I don't know if I can get one to come out now, but I do have a documentary coming out and we'll see. Or maybe maybe just a video blog because I'm telling everybody, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a link to your Facebook page right here in the notes and I, I'm telling people to please go check you out and, uh, you know, if they want to see the video, because I know you've been posting videos on your page. Yeah. And I've also been posting those videos on YouTube. So if you're not on Facebook or you don't want to be friends on Facebook, um, I put them all on YouTube and I'd have to look up what that link is and then send it to you and we can put it on the Sure. We could, we could definitely put it in the show notes. How's your husband doing? How long have you guys been married? You don't have children, correct? No, we don't have kids. Um, we met through work and, um, he is doing okay. Uh, he just, the, the day I was diagnosed, he said, I'm taking a year off. Um, and I was like, wow, okay. And I so appreciate that. That's why we're here on Maui so much now. And um, that just makes life great. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's had times that he'll cry. And I, I think he's like most men who are taught, you're not supposed to be emotional. You're not supposed to be sad, you know? So like most men, he tries not to be. And I keep telling him like, you know, let it out. It's okay. You know? And that's one of the things I've learned that I think is so helpful. If any of you have this experience, I hope you try it soon because this is so helpful. If you're upset about something, just let yourself cry, but don't have any thoughts about it. Just be like, I'm sad. I'm sad. If you have to tell yourself something, I'm sad. I'm sad. This is sad. This is scary. I'm upset. But don't say anything like, I'm too young or he's being a jerk or she should have done this. You know, these are beliefs that we have, but if we just sit with the emotion, we are usually done with it in 30 seconds, maybe 60 seconds. It's unbelievable. And then you can feel quite fine and move on with life. That that's good advice for even people without serious diagnosis, even the yeah. people who deal with that are quote food addicts. If they would just sit with the feeling it would be done and they wouldn't have to then eat over it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so true. That's so true. Yeah. I found that. That's great advice. Are your parents still alive and do you have siblings and how are they handling it? Yeah, my parents are alive and I have one sister. Um, my sister is doing what she normally does when anyone is in, in need, which is she jumps in to help. So she's been doing that. I think that's one of her ways to deal. Um, Mom, I think is having a bit of a rough time, but being English, she's told us like, hey, I'd like to have my rough time alone. Um, and my dad was having a bit of a rough time. And one day we went out to dinner or went out to lunch together. And I taught him basically what I've already said here, which is, you know, dad, like we're so lucky to have had this life we've had. And I, I just went down this list of all these things that have been good. And even, you know, as a therapist, I know many, many people have had bad parts of their life. But overall, um, especially if you've learned from the bad parts, you'll think they're good. And my dad, he got that. And he said, you know, Sarah, I agree. And I'll tell you what I told him, which is what I've told people. And I think one of my very early um, um, videos that I put out, they're like five or 10 minutes, they're not long, is that we've all been given these lives. And some, some of us have been raped, some of us have, you know, been in really bad situations, you know, lost a leg, whatever. They can be really, really hard. But interestingly, when I told people about my, my beliefs about what's going on in life and, you know, what I would call the, um, I wish I could remember the name I use because it's such a common thing I've always talked about, but I lose words all the time now. But long story short, it's like a gold ticket incarnation. Um, which is something that I've had, but a lot of people haven't had, like I haven't been raped um, and I haven't had anything major go on. But then what I tell people is I said, if you have, like, let's say that you went through something really bad or several things really bad. The question I have for you and the, either answer is fair, but the question I have for you is um, what's that thing at the, uh, like if you get onto Las Vegas where they, the roulette wheel, mm -hmm. They have a roulette wheel with a roulette ball and they're saying, okay, well, if you don't like this life you're in, you're 48 years old, 
would you like to go on the roulette wheel? And we can guarantee you there's 3 million people every year who live to be 80 ish, which is the, uh, you know, 80, 83, whatever the normal amount is that people make. Um, we'll put you in that $3 million group and you'll come in at 48 years old. You won't know your past life, but we'll just put you on that and we'll roll you in this, in this roulette wheel and wherever you land anywhere in the world, that's where you're going to go. So you could end up in China, you could end up in Canada, you could end up with money, no money with, you know, there could be a lot of things that change. And the question is, would you do that if you knew that you could go from having this diagnosis at 48 to living until you're 80? And I have not met one person yet, not one person yet who said they would do that. I've had people say to me, look, I've been through a lot of crappy things, but the reason I wouldn't the reason I wouldn't change that is because I feel like I have learned, you know, I've had people tell me like, yeah, I was raped by my dad, but I learned from that and I have grown from that. And now that I'm older, it's not like I'd want to go through it again, but I wouldn't cut my life off to get away from it. It's pretty amazing. Vicki says, I'm learning that gratitude is the path to being happy and Sarah is illuminating that for us right here. Mm -hmm. and are you done with the surgeries and the chemos or radiations or other the, the conventional treatments that they have to offer you? Um, I don't know. There are many options, you know, and as you know, when, when we've got a history with health, <laughs> like we do as vegans, there's a lot of things we're like, I don't know that even though the doctor's saying I should do that, that I should. So I do have a great doctor that way, but um, there's some questions about, should I continue chemotherapy? And uh, I'm pretty much against it. And I think my doctor is going to be against it too. So we'll see if I keep doing it or not. I almost wish there was a handbook for us, us lay people, like on how to, how, how to treat people with, with cancer or a terminal disease, which I don't believe is terminal until you actually die. I really, I, I mean, I am putting my money that you're going to be a miracle and everybody here is praying for that too i'm sorry oh yeah it's hard it's going through a lot chef aj <laughs> I just, it's just so unfair when somebody kind and beautiful and young and vegan i mean it's not that i want anyone to have cancer but it's just it just doesn't seem fair but you know, it, it could be an amazing thing because as you know, you know, we had both gone into this, this area of work and, you know, I'd written some books, but I was working on the side. I was working in research and then I was working as a counselor. So I wasn't getting as much display as you do because you're doing it full time. And now all of a sudden I'm getting a lot of display like this and People are writing what this person just said to you. I'm, I'm hearing that a lot. And I'm so help, I'm so glad that it's helpful, you know? And so if I die over this, which maybe I won't, I mean, that'd be awesome, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'd be so happy. But if I do, like, it's okay, because I've had so many people write me letters saying, wow, sir, you have no idea. I don't know how to put it in words, but you've changed my life. And I wish I could describe it. And I think, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like I've written vegan books and I've gotten a few letters like that and things, but all of a sudden I'm helping people. Like I couldn't be more grateful and, and feel gratitude to be in this position. So if I'm gone in a few months or a few years, like I've probably done more help in those months or years than I might've been able to do otherwise. So it's okay. You know, you've got an amazing attitude. I never know what to like, like, even when I got your email, I, I mean, I, my heart, you know, I never know how much, or even when people say like somebody died, I, I never know how intrusive to be with somebody, you know, that's not like a family member. And like, is it better to tell, you know, like, can you help us? Is, or it's just everybody different. They go through their own disease process differently. Mm -hmm. That's what I think is true. I think everybody's different. And some people, I'm, I'm surprised because I'm different. Um, some people won't tell people when they have cancer. I have a good friend who went through a full cancer and chemo and everything and didn't tell anybody. Um, and she's been through it now. And so she told me recently, but that was really surprising, you know? So everybody's different. And have you ever, I, I mean, just, you know, I think 
there different people do different things. And I know you have probably a lot of different doctors giving you different advice, including plant-based doctors. But I mean, some people do things like they go to other countries, like for healing, like I've heard of John of God, if people mm -hmm. going there, I've heard of people going, people are saying, you know, these different centers in Mexico or other, have you ever entertained any of those things? Yeah, definitely. In fact, John of God is one of the people I thought of, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interesting in the sense, I think that, you know, having worked in medical research for 20 years, I've got one foot that's in the research, you know, I'm on medline.com. I'm reading, you know, the good research from all these years and the other foot loves to sit in, you know, the, the uh, spiritual world. And so that could be John of God, that could be just going to, you know, a local place. I mean, there could be so many things you can do in that field. Um, so, you know, you have to figure out what, what feels good to you. And I think that's one of the interesting things is that I, not only my left brain where the cancer is, but they did a study on me, it's called a WADA study, which they don't really do very often anymore. But um, Anyway, I'm far off the trail on the left side of the brain. That's what the WADA study does. It says, are you right brain, mostly right brain or left brain? And, and if you are, are you like strongly one or the other? And I was like off the charts. Um, they were shocked at how left brain I was. And so the interesting thing about that is that, um, um, what was my point going to be? <laughs> about, about, about entertaining going to some of these other places that people have gone to. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, that probably is where I was going was that that um, that kind of keeps you really in the in the vein of medicine. But interestingly, because my brain was getting so um, uh, what's it called when it gets bigger and bigger uh, when something's it's not hypertrophy, is it? Or... Not hypertrophy, but when when anything like if you hit your arm and it gets a little bigger. Um, this is me losing a word. So we could, have, we could have a game show. Um, yeah, I'm sure people are probably typing the answers. They answer when you hit something and it gets bigger. Um, hmm. When it's just get, um, swollen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we're playing passwords. Debbie, yeah. and Debbie, Debbie Capone has the answer yeah. correct. <laughs> yeah, this is my life now is that people just have to be a little patient when <laughs> coming up with okay. right. what we're talking about. Um, but yeah, so, and what was the word I came up with? Swollen. Swollen. Oh yeah. So when my left brain was swollen, um, my right brain just started working a little bit more, which was really interesting. And so like I've been painting and drawing and doing some really interesting things. And I don't know why I brought that up, but it's kind of neat to well, see. That's good because Monica fun. actually said, are you doing any fun activities in lockdown on Maui? So painting sounds like a fun activity. Yeah. Yeah. I've been painting and drawing a lot, which has been kind of fun. And uh, you can still go walking and things. You're just not allowed to go on the beach anymore, which is driving me nuts. So uh, walked along Hana Highway this morning. Are you familiar with Dr. Kelly Turner's work about, um, I think it's called Radical Recovery or Radical Remission? Yes, I read her book. Yeah. In fact, she's the one, I read two books, one right after the other. That's the book that has nine things you should do. Is that right? Something like that. It's, it's been a while since I read it. Yeah, my husband read it first and then passed it to me and uh, said, well, you pretty much do everything, but read the uh, one on diet. And so I've seen that before that people with brain cancer do tend to do better with a um, keto diet. And I talked to Joel Furman about that, by the way. And he said, you know, I really recommend you do that. And I said, well, look, Joel, I, I, I wanted to go vegan to lose weight. But the book that I read, not realizing what I'd bought, was John Robbins' book, Diet for New America. And when I heard about the animals, I said, I'm never, ever, ever going to eat those again. And so I've not had the issue of going vegan. That's never been an issue. The issue of being a healthy vegan, it can be an issue sometimes. And you know about that. I mean, you tra you're training all these people to really eat a healthy vegan diet. Um, but uh, why did I bring up? Yeah, well, I, I would, would, did they, did they expect or want you to go vegan keto or keto keto? Oh yeah. So J Joel had said, it, you know, either one's fine, but I just don't think you're going to be able to stay vegan keto because there's so little to eat. I mean, the vegan diet is here and the keto diet's here. They're so far apart. And so, um, he was right. There was so little to eat. It was basically like, you know, cause it has to be 85% fat, way fatter than just a regular keto diet for it to help your brain. So there was so little to eat. It was like salad with loads of fatty salad dressing or curry with loads of curry fatty dressing. It's pretty much it. It and doesn't sound very 
delicious to me. Mm-hmm. And if I was living my last few lives, uh, you know, and it's interesting before you said, if I was living my last few lives, if I was living my last few days on earth, I, that doesn't sound like something I'd want to eat. Even if I wasn't, it just sounds good. Yeah. So I literally sat down with my husband one day because, um, you know, I went through this vegan keto diet for probably seven or eight weeks when I did my first thing with keto or with chemo, which was like six weeks. And when I was done, it was really interesting because, um, we went to the doctor and he had said that in three and a half weeks, my, my, um, piece of cancer that was really solid had gone, had, had quadrupled in, in three and a half weeks. And so that's when he was really scared. I think I already mentioned that. And then he um, put me on this chemo and everything. And I, when I came out, everything had gone flat. It hadn't gotten worse. It hadn't gotten better. And the doctor was like, I am so excited. Like, I never see it like this. It's when you're things start moving as fast as yours were, they might slow down, but they'll still get bigger and get worse. And he said, the fact that yours has not changed is unbelievable. And he was so excited about it. And so, you know, the question was, well, there's a good chance it's the diet, you know? I mean, I think Joel Furman was right, but I couldn't eat that way. And I'm not willing to go to a meat-based one. Um, And so my husband and I had a long talk about it. And he said, would you consider, I'm really like, would you consider, let's talk about it and not just, you know, rah, 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 rah. Uh, like, let's really talk about it. Could you do that? And I said, honestly, Mark, I said, if you could tell me that I would kill one animal or two animals in my life to live the rest of my life, maybe I would be willing to do that. You know, a, a, a lion kills a, uh, you know, some other animal out in the safari, you know? So yeah, animals kill each other, but the way our animals are killed in our, uh, you know, farm, animal farms where things are being raised. I said, I can't at all be a part of that at all. And, 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 you know, I just didn't want anything to do with it. So I said, unless I were to start going to some local place where I could see that the animals, you can see this on Maui sometimes, everyone's running around, they're all happy. And, and then one day, whoop, you know, they're killed. Um, I said, if I knew that was happening, uh, I might be more up for it, but probably not <laughs> just for my own spiritual reasons. But that's not likely, you know, cause I like to go out to eat and I like to be with my friends and they might cook or something. And I said, the chances are it's not going to happen. So I'm not willing to eat animals. And uh, we had a long talk about it and he said, so this is your life. And I said, this is my life. It's okay. Like we're all going to die. We're all going to die. Wow. Roxanne says, despite it all, she values how she's helping others. What a treasure. Debbie says, thank you. I needed a good dose of a beautiful outlook today. You know, I don't, um, Kim says, thank you so much for sharing your story. I don't, uh, Jody says, immense gratitude for your sharing your precious time with us today, Sarah, and she's sending you hearts. People are asking if they could see your paintings. Oh, my paintings. Well, uh, let's see. I don't know if I have any, I just, I had one left over. I just gave it to my friend the other day. So that's gone. I'm trying to think if I have. I do. I have a drawing if you want to see that. Yeah, sure. I'll entertain the people while okay. you're getting it. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for being here. Isn't she incredible? I just, I'm, I'm hoping I can get through this interview. It's just, I was so touched by her story. And when I heard about this and I'm so thankful that she is willing to talk about it. So if you know anybody that's struggling with cancer, maybe send them this interview. Okay. So I'm going to tell you, first of all, being a, um, a left brain person. I have never, ever been in art or anything like that. So it's not like I'm, I've turned into some sort of amazing artist, (laughs) but I will tell you, I hope you can see it. Okay. I, I was given a coloring book for adults and look at that. I don't know that to me, that's a lot better than I could have done. That's beautiful. Yeah, you know, and it's like, and when you see like an orange, for example, that's going dark orange to light orange, um, that's the same pen or the same pencil. I've just learned to drag it in a little bit more. So same thing with this, these, uh, in the next one I just started, there, there's several different types of, of green in there. Actually, three different types of green, but it looks to me like there's six or seven different types of green. So it's kind of cool to, to watch that happen. So it's just fun. You know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not turning into any kind of amazing 
uh, artist, but considering what I could do, you know, three years ago, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, we could have started with this, but we didn't. Monica said, can you tell us about your life? Where were you born, went to school, work, et cetera? Sure. Yeah. Um, my dad was in the Air Force, so I was born in Illinois, moved to Germany. And then by the time I was seven, they moved to Gig Harbor, Washington, which is close to Tacoma. And they still live in the same house. And I went to um, I went to several different universities for different things. So I went to uh, University of Washington for an undergrad. I went to Seattle University for a uh, what did I get there? An MBA, <laughs> Master's in Business Association. And I ended up um, a kind of one of those things where you're part online and part in person, more online though, at um, Boston, Boston, is it Boston? University of Massachusetts, Boston, uh, for my counseling, master's in counseling. So that's what I've been doing. And for my main jobs, I worked um, mostly either at Merck or Genentech doing ophthalmology research. And then on the side, I did some vegan books. I already mentioned and uh, wrote a book on the pharmaceutical industry when I was really young. And uh, yeah, you know, other than that, just love to play tennis and travel and, you know, had some things like that. Thank you. For Have you ever played pickleball? Cause you said you might come to the Palm Springs area. Oh, I would love to try it. No, I've not really. I mean, I've played it a few times, but not many, but I used to play tennis, but I ended up getting back surgery because my back went out so badly from it. How did you get involved working with Dr. Furman? Oh, that's a great question. So <laughs> this is kind of a funny story. Um, I went to one of his annual things that he does. Uh, it was maybe his very first one. If it wasn't, it was a second one. It was in Utah. And um, they started with a dinner where you just go get your dinner and sit down and then you go up and the program starts. And so I was sitting, I think by myself or maybe with one other person at a table and Joel and his wife and two or three other people from his family come over to this table that was mostly empty, this big round table and says, do you mind if we join you? I'm like, no, that's great. You know? So I'm sitting next to him and at some point he says, well, I need to stand up and, uh, you know, tell everyone to go upstairs and, uh, and, and I said, wait, you're going to stand up and tell them to go upstairs. Like, shouldn't you have somebody do that for you since you're the, the person in charge of speaking? And he goes, well, no, I don't really have anybody to do that. And I'll just do it. And I said, well, who's going to introduce you? He says, I don't have anybody introducing me. And I said, okay, I'm going to do this. And he says, well, you don't have to do that. I said, yeah, I'm going to do this. And so I did, I stood up and I said, if everybody can head upstairs in the next five minutes, that would be great. And when I got up there, I hadn't had time to like look up all of his history and all that kind of stuff. So I got up there and I said, it's just so funny. I said, how many of you have had your life changed by knowing Joel Furman or reading his information? And all of a sudden, you know, hands started going up, you know, and everybody, and people started yelling over each other, you know, I lost 60 pounds. Well, I had no, no cancer after that, or I got rid of my cardiac disease after that. And everyone's yelling out their stuff. And Joel's literally sitting there in the front going, <laughs> I was just so shocked that, you know, this was happening and that was the introduction. And from that day forward, uh, he ended up hiring me and I ended up working with him and flew out to the East coast every, every month. And so it's been kind of interesting, but that went on for uh, not too long. Cause I ended up going back into research again. So that, yeah. that is a great story. You know, I, 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 we focus so much on, like you were talking left brain and right brain. And, and I find that there's, there's like kind of a disconnect almost in the plant-based world between science and spirituality. Mm -hmm. And it's not, not, I'm not criticizing it I, because people are entitled to believe what mm -hmm. they believe. And I'm mm -hmm. not saying it's even a bad thing, but it's refreshing when you have somebody that can, you know, do both. And some of the doctors that I interview, they tend to mostly be more Adventist doctors. They have, you know, the, those pieces together. Mm -hmm. They can look at the science, but they can also, you know, kind of look at the heart and, um, and I've been doing more of these on my channel. I had like a Reiki person and, you know, some people are going to bash me because it's unscientific or whatever. I don't care because I'm 60 now. Once you're 60, you don't really care anymore, you know? <laughs> so I mean, not, but uh, like a Reiki person and an animal communicator and another spiritual lady. And I was just wondering if you've ever done or considered some of those like alternate healing modalities like Reiki now or, or, or things like that. Yeah, I did try Reiki earlier in my life and I didn't find much of a, I, I didn't find a whole lot for, for whatever I was going through at the time. I don't even remember now. Um, 
But I have found uh, for me specifically, and I think a lot of these things can work differently for different people. Um, but for me, really going into a quiet mental place and just getting really quiet uh, is really helpful. And so that's one of the things I've spent a lot of time doing. And then, um, you know, there are a lot of people here on Maui that have all kinds of different um, ways to treat you. And also those little oils, different oils. So that's kind of funny because I have had, I probably had 10 people now come to me with a little thing of oil and say, oh my gosh, this is the life changing oil, or this is the, you know, I'll, I'll save your life oil. <laughs> so I'm not really sure which one is which, but you know, there are those two, um, some of those I've liked, especially if I like the smell. Um, and I'm trying to think what else I've done that, um, you know, some things aren't really that, that non-medical, but things like chiropractor, that's been really helpful to me lately. Um, but for me, most of it's mental, it's, it's spiritual. It's like, what do you believe? And so for me, as I sit and I meditate every day and, um, I've had times in my life when I'd meditate for like two hours a day. And so if I'm sitting there and I'm meditating and sometimes I'll just sit there and think, you know, what are you grateful for Sarah? And it's, I mean, it's amazing. I, I, I hope everybody tries that. Just sit down for 20 minutes and ask yourself, what am I grateful for? And it's, I mean, it can put you in tears sometimes, not sad tears, just happy tears. Like, wow, that I could do that, that I could help somebody, that I could own this, that I could be a mother or whatever, whatever you're going through in life. It's pretty amazing. You know, it's hard to be unhappy when you start thinking about the things you're grateful for. That, that is so true. You know, I, I don't think I'm afraid of death as much as I'm afraid of dying. What I mean by that, like, do you, this may be too personal of a question, but I guess, have they told you that, you know, I'm thinking that you're going to live and everybody <laughs> here is, but do they tell you how you die when you have cancer? Like, is it a, is it a sharp, painful death? Is it like, I mean, see, cause nobody ever talks about dying. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really important. And I'm not afraid to talk about this stuff at all. Um, whether it's stuff like this with you or just straight up with the doctor, Hey, what do I need to experience? And so sometimes I want to know, and sometimes I don't want to know yet. Like I don't need to know. So when I was first diagnosed, I didn't need to hear, you know, yeah, you're going to be dead and you're likely to have this, this, and this happen. What I said was, Hey, when is that? When, when do I need to start knowing that stuff? And he told me. And so, um, you know, hearing some of this stuff, yeah, it's likely that people with brain cancer, they can be dead in four days after getting bad experiences or four months, or sorry, not months, four weeks. It generally doesn't go longer than about four weeks. Um, and so to me, I sit there and think, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful, you know, because a lot of people are in pain for years, you know, years. And here I'll likely only have four weeks of pain. The pain can be headaches, it can be diarrhea, it can be throwing up, those are common. I can go blind. Um, I've already noticed my, my uh, eyes are already going and you guys have already noticed that I lose my brain sometimes as to what I was talking about. So yeah, this stuff is all starting to happen and, and it's okay. Um, and I'm grateful, I'll tell you this is a tough one too because I never liked this before, but um, uh, I'm trying to think the steroids never been a fan of steroids and most of my girlfriend oh you don't want to be on steroids those are terrible well let me tell you like if you are going through what i'm going through right now i'm so grateful for the steroids because uh they're really getting rid of a lot of pain that i have otherwise and it's made my face fatter hey i don't have any cheekbones that i used to have and i you know if i did gain weight in the past i would gain it in my butt and my thighs but now i've gained it in my stomach which is weird for me i never really gained it in my stomach but well that's steroids but I just think I'm grateful I'm not in pain, you know, I'm grateful I'm not in pain. And one of the things I tell my friends a lot, just as a side note, is that we are not what we look like. Like we are so taught as women that you've got to look good. You've got to try to look young. You've got to do your makeup and your hair and look thin. And, you know, when I think, you know, if you start looking around the world at people, you know, or know of, think of Oprah, for example. I mean, Oprah is obese. She's a big, big woman. Oh, sometimes she's not. She loses it, but gains it back. But I don't know one person that said to me, oh, I don't like Oprah. Or God forbid, no one's ever said, I don't like Oprah. She's too big. You know, if she were thin, I would like her. I've never heard that in my life. Like she's a good, kind person. 
And that's what people really like about her. But in our brains, we're taught, no, that's not what people like. People like it when you're thin and pretty and everything else. And we need to really start getting that, you know? And that's why I'm okay with my stomach sticking out, my face getting around. It's not my choice. I wouldn't choose that, but I'm okay with it because I think, wow, I'm still alive. Like I'm still alive. I'm still here. You know, I'm, I'm on Maui of all places. Like God forbid, how many people get to be in a place as nice as Maui right now. And so just spending this time where you're constantly being, I don't know, just, just grateful and aware can really make you such a happy person, even if you're diagnosed like this. So I was, you know, I, I, it's funny because I always try to put myself in other people's positions. Like, what would I do if this happened to me? And of course I can speculate, but you never really know until it happens to you. But, you know, I'm pretty strict with my diet and I'm still buying into, you know, some of the things you talked about, because when you're in the public eye, you get criticized a lot by how you look and how much you weigh and things like that. But I, I thought that like, if I was given a terminal diagnosis, I would, I would still stay vegan like you. I, I would not eat an animal to save, even if it meant saving my own life, but I'd probably eat all the crap I could. I mean, cause like I'm going to die anyway, you know, I'd go to, well, I don't think Cinnabon's vegan, but you know, all the vegan ice, all the stuff that I don't eat now. Yeah. Does, does that ever cross your mind? Like, Oh, what the hell? I'll, I'll just eat a bunch of crap. <laughs> Um, well, I'll tell you what, it's been, it's been difficult because there's a part of me that wants to be like that because I do try to, uh, stop eating so much sugar. I, I love sugar. So I tend to eat, especially Maui has such a big vegan community that back home, the local Whole Foods has a couple of like, eh, uh, vegan cookies, but here they're like, oh my God, that's good. You know? So here on Maui, I'm like always wanting to eat all these vegan things and they've got so many of them. Um, but I've also found that if I try to eat this healthier diet and, you know, this keto diet part of the time being keto, then I try to do that when I'm on certain kinds of medications and so on and so forth. Um, so I don't completely not allow it, but I know that if, if the doctor said, Hey, Sarah, like you're really, you're done. And I can feel it. Like I can hardly even tell who the doctor is. I can't give you my husband's name anymore. I'd be like, okay, for me, the vegan cookies. <laughs> But I have to be pretty far gone at that point because I do think that eating healthier is probably giving me more time. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Stephanie wants to know that obviously you're under quarantine right now, like every most people are in most parts of the world. But when it's lifted, do you have a bucket list? Oh, you know, that's a great question. And the answer is no. Um, and I, the reason for that is you know, what I call my gold ticket incarnation, that I have been spending my life doing things. And um, I know this is going to sound kind of weird and some people might be like, oh, she's just, she's definitely weird. Um, but, you know, maybe knowing that I've been in medical research all this time, you might go, well, maybe not. Um, the, we the weird thing is that when I was about eight, I was just out playing. Nothing had happened recently. No one had died. No dogs had died. Nothing like that. I was just out playing, having a good day. And all of a sudden, I just had this piece of information that came to me that said, you're going to die young. And I went, okay. And I wasn't upset about it back then. I don't know why I wasn't upset about it back then, but I wasn't. Um, and so going through my life, it's not something I've thought about often. I've often wondered, you know, like after five years, like, oh, wow, I'm 25 now. I guess I'm still young, you know, or, and recently, you know, 46, 47, I remember thinking, wow, maybe that wasn't true. I really thought that was going to be true, but 48, maybe not. Maybe I'm going to live till 80. And so I didn't know. Um, but the interesting thing is that I just didn't, um, um, I'm trying to think what my point was I was going to make. <laughs> I had a point. I think you had a bucket list, if you had a bucket list. Oh, oh yeah, thank you. That, you know, all these things I've been telling you, like for the last 10 years, especially, I've really been looking into life and everything. But, you know, having that information when I was young, I don't remember thinking about it often, but I just always lived my life. So if I have this idea of, you know, I should write a book. Oh, you don't know how to write a book. That's all right. I'll, I'll just write it and someone else has to know what you do with it. I don't know. Somebody will figure it out. And I would go do it. You know, oh, I should go. I should go on safari. Well, how are you going to get money for that? That's expensive. I don't know. We'll figure it out. We need to go on safari, you know. So I would just see the things I wanted to do and I would go do them. And sometimes it would take a while if I had to raise money, but that's all right. You know, that's how life is. Yeah. You're, you're just remarkable, you know, and I don't know what to say. I mean, now I wish I'd 
known you better the last 17 years. We met at one of Jeff Nelson's Veg Source conferences. I mean, we kept in touch. You're the one that told yeah. me about the stackable gourmet, which I love to death. <laughs> and I always got your letter. And, you know, I think if anything to be learned from this is, guys, if you love somebody, tell them now. Don't wait. Yeah. Don't wait until you get that email, phone call. You know, you, it just, your story reminds me of uh, one of my favorite plays by Thornton Wilder, it's called Our Town. And Emily says, it's the very end of the play, if you're not familiar with it, she goes to the, the stage manager, who I believe played by Paul Newman in one of the productions. She goes, does anyone ever realize life while they live it every, every minute? And he says, no, saints and poets maybe, they do some, and I would say Sarah Taylor. Mm, oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, I'm here. We are friends, even though we haven't spent a lot of time with each other over 17 years. It's been 17 years, my friends. <laughs> well, if you ever want to come on again, I'm sure you could just really inspire a lot of people like you're doing now. And mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm still going to put my money on that yeah. you be a survivor because that's what I, that's the I'm very selfish and that's the outcome I want because I think you still have one more great book in you <laughs> yeah we'll see that would be that would be really cool I'd be happy about that yeah. yeah well thank you so much and everybody I've been posting the links and I'll put them in the show notes please follow Sarah on Facebook or YouTube and and please share this broadcast with as many people as you can even if they don't have cancer because it's really one of the most inspiring ones I've ever done thank you so much Sarah thank you AJ I appreciate it Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.